let's go into the word of god today we are going to see from the book of isaiah the topic is the year of the lord's favor can we all say together the year of the lord's favor isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 and 2 if you have your bibles take your bible if it's on the screen uh, you have your gadgets take make a note of it and and always have this practice of journaling because it helps you like you no know, to to store certain things to remember certain things in that process god speaks god actually edifies us let's read together 61 verse 1 and 2 the spirit of the sovereign lord is on me it looks like the spirit of sovereign lord is not on you come on let's all read together the spirit of the sovereign lord is upon me because the lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our god to comfort all who mourn it's a very beautiful passage and uh, if you go home read the entire passage but today we are going to focus uh, here isaiah actually says there is a time that is coming that god would pour out his spirit and then he would make us anoint us to proclaim the good news three things that are that are that are put upon us to proclaim one is to proclaim the good news can we all say together proclaim the good news second is to proclaim the freedom to called to proclaim freedom third is to proclaim the year of the lord's favor the year of the lord's favor how many of you know that that in the old testament times not everybody received the holy spirit because it was not given to them only few received and enjoyed the baptism of the holy spirit only few were were actually able to uh, operate in the power of the holy spirit only few and god was waiting for generations he was working with the people with their heart for generations uh, for a time to come where he can pour his spirit on all people and he was waiting for that time he didn't give up in between because people were rebelling people were going away from him but still he was working with his people he was working through generations to wait to wait to wait and the time came through his son he has finished the work on the cross so that he can pour his spirit once again on us how many of you are glad to know that that he wants to once again dwell in us he was waiting for it and isaiah sees isaiah sees that he sees that oh the spirit of the lord is upon me somebody is going to do that what is that and even as he is reading he is seeing two things one is the the year of the lord's favor and the day of god's vengeance can we all say it together the year i want all of you to stretch your hands even if your clothes are a little tight it's okay stretch your hands and say the, the favor of god is like this the year of the lord's favor it's a, it's so big and there is a day of god's vengeance in fact it should be the other way for all that we have done against god for all the rebelling that the nation of israel did god should have done the other way he should have showed little favor and he should have had his vengeance for a long period of time but in turn the nature of god is that that instead of giving punishment he said i'm going to show you favor there is a favor that i'm going to shower upon this world through my son year of lord's favor and the day of god's vengeance god is just waiting and and isaiah sees both that there is a day that the lord is coming but when he comes he comes with favor and there is a day that he is going to come and after this period he is going to come and that day is the judgment it's the day of god's vengeance he sees both but isaiah didn't know when it is going to happen 700 years before christ he has actually prophesied Let's go to Luke chapter 4 the parallel in Luke chapter 4 verse 14 to 21 Let's read Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the 
spirit and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue and as was his custom he stood up and to read and the scroll of prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it he found the place where it is written. Let's read together. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery for sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the lord's favor then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him he began by saying to them today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing if you notice in the Jewish custom that in the synagogue, when they read the word, they will stand and they would read the word. Once it is read, the one who was actually reading will sit down and everybody else will be standing and there will be conversations of teaching and questions that will happen. But if you notice in our current pattern, it's opposite. The one who preaches stands and all of you are sitting very enjoying. If you stand, you will listen properly. You will not sleep. It's the other way around where he sits and he actually teaches and, and everybody's eyes were fixed on Jesus, what he is going to say. And he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. How many of you noticed that there was a small difference between Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 to what Jesus said? Jesus stops, though there was no verses when he read the scroll, it is a passage. He stops halfway when he says the year of the Lord's favor. He didn't go to the day of God's vengeance. He stops at the year of the Lord's favor and then he says it is fulfilled. Why? Because this favor has begun through me and he came and initiated the time of the Lord's favor upon this world. He read that and said today it is fulfilled. The time has begun people, those who are going through issues and curses and the problems of sin and everything. Jesus came to deliver them. Jesus came to give the good news to them. He proclaimed, He taught them. When they were asked, are you the Messiah? When John's uh, disciples come and ask, are you the Messiah? He says, what is happening around? Because that's a prophecy. The blind will see, the deaf will hear. It is happening. Then you should know by what is happening that I am the Messiah. The year of the Lord's favor has already begun. And Jesus read that, closed it, kept it and said, today it is fulfilled. I want to tell you church, we are living in the time of God's favor. Amen. We are living in a time of God's favor. God wants to restore things in our lives. God wants to restore things in our lives. He wants to actually remove every form of things that are attached to us because of our sin, because of our curse that is upon uh, the darkness, the work of darkness against everything God wants to remove because He is showing favor to us. That is God's mercy. How many of you know that we all need the Holy Spirit? We need the Holy Spirit. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. Can we all say together? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. Why He has to anoint you? We need the Holy Spirit for inner personal transformation. Can we all say together? Personal transformation. You need the anointing of God for a personal transformation. Let's say it as inner anointing. You need an inner anointing for your personal transformation. Tell the person seated next to you, you need the inner anointing. Tell them, tell them, you need the inner anointing for your personal transformation. And you need an outer anointing for a public proclamation. God has given us this 
enablement through the spirit so that your life is edified and you would proclaim why the spirit is given so that you would proclaim the good news those who are broken you would bind them up those who are prisoners you would proclaim freedom to them those who are in darkness you will set them bring them to light you are called to tell people irrespective of all that you are going through irrespective of all the bad things that you are seeing in your life i want to tell you that lord's favor is upon you Hallelujah. And that's what God is asking us to proclaim. That's what God is asking us to proclaim. That's exactly was the ministry of Jesus. If you look at this slide, there are summaries in the gospels where the apostles put together what was the ministry of Jesus? Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 9 it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people Matthew 9 35 Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in the synagogue proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sicknesses that was his ministry that was his ministry this is nothing different from what is said in Isaiah 61 Acts chapter 10 when the apostles preached the gospel after Jesus when they went and preached and they said you know how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy spirit he announced the good news of peace through jesus christ he went around doing good healing all who were under the power of the devil that's exactly what was the ministry of jesus jesus went he, he was teaching in the synagogues he proclaimed the good news he healed people those who were oppressed by the enemy we read from matthew uh, chapter 10 Jesus when he sent the apostles two by two when he sent the 12 into like you know the nation of Israel and this is the ministry he gave them what is the ministry he gave them these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instruction do not go among the gentiles nor enter any town of the samaritans go rather to the lost sheep of Israel I want you to make a note of it Jesus says go rather to the lost sheep of Israel as you go what do you have to do Come on, I want you to hear you all say, proclaim this message. What is the message? The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. In another occasion, Jesus himself said, my ministry is all about, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus stuck to what was assigned for him when he came by the Father. He never actually... went and did what was given he was faithful except for one time when his parents took him to egypt when herod was killing all the babies apart from that there is no record that jesus went even outside these territories his ministry is with this territory <coughs> excuse me he stuck to what was assigned and he told his disciples also the same ministry that i am doing i am giving you that same ministry go to by to go into the lost sheep of israel but don't go to the gentiles don't go to the samaritan villages but wherever you go proclaim prepare the people the kingdom of god has come near exactly same ministry he gave i want you to make a note jesus specifically told them not to go out apart from israel Let's read Matthew chapter 9 and this is something that I want all of you to like you know you read in your bible mark it in your bible I want you to make it as a prayer I want you to make this as a prayer Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 to 38 can we all read together is it okay are you all listening this morning can we all read together when he saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless then He said to his disciples the harvest is it sounds like the harvest is not plentiful come on thousands of people to, together saying the harvest is plentiful as the lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into the harvest field the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few so ask the lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest field but before that what jesus is doing is when he saw the people he had compassion he was able to recognize that they were harassed and they were helpless they were like sheep without a shepherd 
Jesus is not just talking about they were oppressed by the Roman emperor and they were like, you know, going through probably poverty or difficult situations. Not just that. He was able to see that spiritually Satan is harassing people. Spiritually, Satan is actually having a hold over people. They don't have leadership. They don't have anybody to guide them and they are harassed in many ways and they are helpless because the entire world was under the evil one. And when Jesus saw, he's saying, that's why we need laborers who would go, who would proclaim, who would set these people free. On this morning, church, it is a call for all of us. It is a call for all of us that are we willing to go? Are we willing to go? And this morning, I want you to pray. Make it a prayer that Lord, help me to see beyond the physical. Can we all say it together? Help me to see beyond the physical. Because everything that you see physically in this world, it's all vain. It's not true. It's all vain. Satan builds so many things, the fancy things of the world. It just actually distracts people and carry them off. And we sometimes also go away with that same flow. No, we are called and we are actually baptized in the Holy Spirit to see beyond the physical. To know what is happening in the lives of people. That's why it's important to see. How many of you heard the news that there was one wedding in Iran and a lot of people were gathered at the wedding and there were celebration and people were like there was a banquet and there were fireworks that were happened inside the celebration and the entire auditorium caught fire so quickly and hundred people died at the wedding. If you if you when you hear it, oh it's a very bad news. But if you see the footage of that video, you would be moved. Why is such a terrible thing happening at a wedding, right? In the same way, that's what when you see. I would challenge you, I would encourage you. Take a day off. Take a day off. The same route that you take to go to your office, the same route that you take to go to your school or college or work or whatever it is, just go in the same route and observe the city. I'll tell you, God will speak to you. Which we have not noticed he would open it and show to you. He will help you to see things. Hey, I have never seen this. This is happening in my city. And those are the times the Spirit of God stirs us for certain things and put burdens in our heart to pray. And that prayer will bring forth change. Do you know why you need compassion? Because compassion will push you out of your comfort zone. Sometimes I, I know that somebody needs help, but I can still be in my comfort zone and help. But the moment I empathize with that person, when I have compassion in my heart, though I am, it is going to be uncomfortable for me, I would still do it. That's the reason we need to have compassion. It will push me out of my easy chair. It will push me out of all my procrastination and it will make me go and do something because we need and we need to ask God, Jesus, if you had compassion over people, your body, we need to have compassion over people, the same people who are harassed and helpless. Can we all quickly pray this moment? Father, we ask you this morning, Lord, the same compassion that you had when you saw people, let it come upon us this morning. Let it come upon us this morning. Let it come upon us this morning that when we see people, we would be able to know their spiritual condition, Father God. We would not be carried away by the, by the outward things, oh Master God. Help us to know what is happening beyond the physical. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. How many of you know that recently there was an incident that happened in, in one of the places, uh, uh, a building in, in our international airport one lady one lady came with her two kids to a theater there to watch a movie she came to watch a movie with her children and in the middle of the movie she left the children watching the movie she came out of the uh, building came out of the theater and she jumped out from the building and she passed away who can ever tell a mother who comes with two children to a 
theater to watch a movie spend time with the children when we look externally it looks like you no know, she wants to spend time with the children what worst thing can be in their life she they have come to enjoy in the middle of the movie the children didn't even know she went and she jumped out i want to tell you this is what people are going through what if somebody was there though physically nothing was revealed but they were able to sense there's something wrong i want to tell you that's exactly what god wants us to do every one of us every one of us all we see in the instagram reel is not true it's not true what people put as pictures in as families and this and that not always it is true but god wants us to see beyond actually god taught me once and uh, me uh, as a family we went to do a restaurant um, this is one of the situations where we went to a restaurant to have a good meal it was a it was a special day so we went there and and uh, we just sat around and the uh, waiter who came and who, who, who was serving he was keeping the plates like you know just like that and he was not paying attention and like you know you you i was like little disturbed and irritated like i have come to have a good time with my family and this person is not doing his job well i got irritated for a moment then then god actually like you know whispered to me and saying like you know when are you going to see beyond the physical then i say like what lord you don't know what is happening in his life so then i kept quiet i calmed down i didn't even show anything and then i was asking god what it is so god put in my heart to go and tell him that what he was going through with his father you need to seek jesus jesus will help you the moment i said that his eyes got filled and he didn't express because he is in the middle of serving tables and he cannot take a moment to just talk to me and i was able to see that no god was speaking to him though i didn't know what to do after that right but but that moment i also learned that whatever we see physically is not the same inside people are going through much more than that and and god wants us to see and have compassion and to act are you listening this morning so the lord of the harvest has to send us as laborers into your friends who are around you sometimes we look at their life and think like no i want to have a life like them you will have no idea what they are going through we will have no idea what they are going through our life is blessed hallelujah i want you to read this passage with me where satan there are a few things i put together how satan controls this world how we can control this world satan has no actually legal right to be in this world because this world is given to mankind man has authority in this world god gave it to the first adam and adam lost that authority and jesus the second adam who came and who actually adam disobeyed god and he lost the authority the second adam jesus who came and obeyed god in everything and he gained back that authority as a man in this world that's why if god needs to work in this world he works with people if he wants to fulfill his purposes he works with his people and he fulfills his purposes satan does the same thing he uses people to fulfill his evil purposes that's why for us that we need to involve god in every situation we need to ask god that's prayer involving god into the life equation my equation of my life i involve god If you notice all the occultic practices and things like that they invoke the spirits into that why do they do that because they are the medium to invoke the spirits because the spirits cannot legally function so he creates certain things to have dominion over this world the first thing that we see is the philosophies that he has created in this world can we all say together philosophies of the world colossians chapter 2 verse 8 he created ideologies he created belief systems in this world and so that whoever whoever subscribes to it whoever actually believes it he will have his dominion over them whether it is numerology astrology whatever different uh, ideologies that are coming and people believe those things so that that will actually have 
blessings over our, over our lives. In the Old Testament, God said, don't actually look at the skies and the stars and, and believe on them because the moment you do it, they will have dominion over you. It is clearly given. Those days, God says, don't worship anything of that. It will have dominion over you. So, but in the world, the people believe and they would. That are philosophies, many philosophies. Ungodly philosophies he creates. And the moment we just, like, you know, accept it, he will have dominion over our lives. He creates patterns. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it talks about patterns of this world. He has created customs, traditions, patterns, culture. They are countercultural to God's traditions, God's ways, God's will. And these countercultures will be celebrated in the world. Shown as that is the right way to do. He creates and when people actually get into it, you become captive. He actually takes dominion over our lives. Satan has schemes against us. Against every one of us. Against people. He, he has schemes. Tell the person seated next to you that there is a scheme against you. Congratulations. They're, they have introduced a new scheme against you. Specific scheme for every one of us. How to deceive us. How to distract us from the faith. Constantly working. Schemes of the enemy. That's why Paul says, like, no, we are not unaware of his schemes. We know what his schemes are. And we know how to handle those schemes. So if he comes to build, like, you know, problems between people. He wants to break relationships. He wants to bring disunity. He's saying, no matter what, I will forgive anything that the body of Christ does against me. Any, anybody in the church, whatever they do, I will be willing to forgive. You know why? I don't want Satan to have any hold over what happens in God's family. So Paul says, I'll forgive everybody. I'm aware of what he is doing. Anybody Children of God, having unity, He would come to divide. Wherever there is, a, there is a presence, there is division, you see, there is a presence of evil there. A family united, doing something, He wants to divide. That's why He wants to divide families, He wants to divide the church, He wants to divide, the, He wants to break the unity between the churches. He always wants to scheme against and divide us, never allow us to be united. He wants to come and distract. If you are a person, you have accepted the Lord, you, you, are, you are anointed and you are passionate for God. You know, he, he knows that it is hard to take you away from God. So he would come and distract you. How many of you know that an aircraft who, which takes from one airport and it goes to another airport, when they take off, right, when they set their course, even a two degree change in the direction it will take you off from the destination, miles. Are you able to follow what I'm saying? That's how Satan wants to distract us a little bit. So that over a period of time, instead of going this way, he will go another way. That's why course correction is very important. Why do we need to keep assessing our life with the word of God? Because Satan will distract us, keep distracting us slowly. So we need to get back to what God wants us to do. Schemes of the enemy. Doctrine of demons. Paul says uh, there, are, there are some theological ideas, some doctrines that are taught by demons, pervert things. And people believe because they are blinded and they would follow. Recently, in our missions conference, one of our uh, missionary who came and in, in the church camp, she actually shared that in Varnasi, how many of you know that in Varnasi there are a lot of goris, agoris who actually like, you know, uh, they will not dress full of ashes and they would take certain things for ecstasy. So in that state of mind, they will actually uh, have spiritual revelations and like, you know, things like that. So such people, people go to them and pour milk on them. And the milk actually goes all over their body. They will catch that milk and actually drink. That's nothing comparatively. There are people who would give their wives to the agoris. They, it is considered as blessing for the family and generations. People blindly believe such practice. 
you'd be thinking hey, it's common sense why they no you're blinded you would believe you would do like that there are many practices happens even in our own like you know land in this city people do witchcrafts people practice certain things they do things which are not right but they they do that doctrines taught by demons pervert things how are people able to do cruel things against somebody cup of demons first corinthians 10 21 cup of demons what is cup of demons it's like you cannot take part or belong to some practices and things of this world and also belong to god's family either one there is nothing in between you cannot take part in some practices and belong there you, sometimes we think that we can belong in two places no you belong in only one place you can be placed in another place Jesus actually called us and put us in his family and then he says I send you into the world. He is not asking us to belong in the world. He is sending us into the world for a reason. Strongholds in the mind of people. Satan builds strongholds in the mind of people. What is a stronghold? Stronghold is nothing but a collection of real time negative experiences of people and cementing them with a lie and building a resistance against the truth. that is the stronghold anybody who has a stronghold in their mind will resist certain things how many of you have gone through negative experiences in life i see few disciples of jesus christ who have gone through jesus said you will have troubles and trials right we go through was it real or was it just a feeling it was real it was hurtful you went through negative experiences in life and satan takes those real life experience and he gels it cements it with the lies and makes it as a strong thing in your mind that's why for some people those strongholds blocks everything that we say to them bounces off no matter what you say nothing is going in because there is a stronghold how can we then share with them that's why we need to pray those spiritual things will actually be broken even before we minister to them that's how satan controls people occultic practices witchcraft i've seen those who practice witchcraft their family in generations will actually go through a such a destruction probably people are doing it for because when you do some occultic practices it gives you what satan trades is that if you do these things you will get power money fame and there are levels and rankings in how whatever you do that much control you will have over people and people do that because they want to have the power they want to have because they are blinded i've seen real time in my families that people those who practice witchcraft their next generation is completely like you no know, in a mess for what the parents did let's read this from the next slide satan has blinded their eyes and mind if it's on the screen let's read satan has blinded their eyes and mind and hardened their hearts john 12:40 it says he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and i would heal them they are seeing but they are not understanding they are actually their hearts are hardened so are they, they don't get any understanding they are not able to see they are not able to understand so they are not able to turn to god and jesus says who has blinded satan has blinded their eyes second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says the god of this age has what blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of christ who is in the image of god he wants to blind people so that they will not see the light of the gospel this morning i want to quickly do an illustration can i have your help yes
What Satan is doing is, he's blindfolding people and he has made them captives, right? And you know what he is doing? He, he is actually like, you know, making people blindfolded. They don't really know how the world is functioning, what is happening in the world and he harasses them. He harasses them. Walk, walk this way. Go. He harasses them. He pulls their ears, plucks their air, and like, you know, pushes them. But they are not able to see who is doing that to us. Who is doing that? So I'm, I'm, there is bad thing happening in my life. Who is doing it? They cannot see. They are harassed and they are helpless. You know where you are standing? You do not know? That's what we want. So I can steal from you. Nice phone, huh? It is almost like you are in a dark room, okay? You are in a dark room and there is no light in the dark room and he still blinds you and makes you sit in a dark room. How dark it will be? It's already dark, but still he blinds you, he actually binds you and he makes you live this way. Miserable it will be. What if you are in a dark room and there is a light in the corner? What will you do? Eventually, we will move towards the light. If you are in a forest, if you are in a like, you know, place abandoned, it's pitch dark everywhere and you see a light in a distance, what you would do? You would go to that light, right? Satan doesn't want us to see the light. You know, what is the light in this world? The gospel is the light. When Jesus came, he brought the light. So because the light has come, now he wants to blind them. Even when the light is on, he cannot see. If I tell him there is a chair here, sit down. He will try to sit, <laughs> but there is no chair there. Right? So he would harass them. He can do whatever they, he wants to do. They will not even understand. And that's why they are prisoners in darkness, captives, blinded. Satan is actually doing whatever he wants to do. Thank you, Da. Can we put our hands together for... I love you, okay? <laughs> I don't uh, intend to harass you. Are you able to understand the picture? Remember this illustration. We are going to read from Isaiah chapter 60. It will make so much of sense. And Isaiah says that. He harasses people. He controls people with these things. But you know what God did to us? You know what God did to us? If you read Colossians 1, 13 to 14. Colossians 1, 13 to 14. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and he has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. What he did is we were in that darkness, blinded, not knowing what is happening. But Jesus came because somebody came and shared the gospel with us and we put our trust in that gospel and we believed in God and we were set free. So he rescued us from the dominion of darkness in, and placed us as his son in his kingdom, in his family. He rescued us and put us here. So the scripture says that in 1 John 5, 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe. The evil one cannot what? Can we all say it together? The evil one cannot what? Harm them. Just look at the person next to you and say that no, Satan has no power over you. Just tell that with confidence. Are you scared to say that? Tell them, Satan has no power over you. Satan has no control over you because he has no power over the people of God. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus took us from the darkness and he put us in his church, his body. That's why the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. He has no power over us. Anytime you are actually, you are instilled with fear because the enemy comes against you in different forms. You need to understand, you have no power over me. Jesus said that. Jesus said that if you read um, John 14, 30, before the crucifixion, he says, I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. But he has no hold over me. Hallelujah. 
now god gives that authority to us and he has redeemed us to be his family so no matter whatever satan is trying to do he has no power over the church how many of you want to say amen amen he can scheme that's why it is important for we as followers of god after you have been placed in the family of god don't meddle with the things of this world then you you yourself go and surrender namba urla oru oru saying irukku sonda kaasle is nothing that we know we are redeemed from the darkness and we still go and indulge and not have awareness of what god's word says so we get into the practice and customs of the world in our businesses in our practices we do certain things because it says it's it's uh, business ethics no it's not business ethics it's not right before god it's not toril dharmam it's not so that's why god actually redeemed us and put us here that's why we need to be careful we are placed here satan has no power but there is one way there is one way he can defeat us you know what just imagine you are in a, in, in a boxing match okay you are in a boxing match and uh, just imagine that you are in a boxing match not with your spouse okay you are in a boxing match like you know where you are against satan and satan is coming and you need to like you know box him and satan is coming with all his power and schemes and he is trying to box you out right but one thing satan knows that no hey this match the result of this match i know he this guy is playing this guy is actually fighting against me from the victory standpoint i am going to lose against him because god has already redeemed him no matter how much i come against him the end of this match is that he is going to win how many of you seen some cricket matches where um, uh, say test matches there are the last day they will be playing and and already we know that one team is going to win because they are ahead of them in score but still the match will be continuing till the end but the result we already know right in the same way satan knows the result that i no matter what i do i cannot win over because jesus victory is upon this person there is no difference between the head and the body they have the victory but he knows one thing how i can win over them you know what in a boxing match in a boxing match no matter how many times you fall as long as you stand up you are still in the game but he wants you to give up that's the only way that he can win over us just uh, look at the person seated next to you and say don't give up don't give all you have to do is just stand all you have to do is just hold on that's why the scripture says stand firm in your faith don't give up when you go through the struggles and things of this life you may think this will never end god i want to give up i want to tell you this morning just hold on and stand don't tap out from your match if paul says the race that is cut for you a match that has been set for you and satan just stand in the match don't tap out and say i'm giving up that's the only way satan can win against us as long as i stand i'm going to win hallelujah so we need to we need to hold on to god and say satan you have no power i want you to read this passage from he is the prince of the air He is the God of this age. You know what? You need to read Colossians 2 verse 13 to 15 where he says that for he forgave us all our sins having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities he has made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms who had control these demonic spirits who had control over people jesus took everything and he nailed it on the cross and he demonstrated and dismantled every powers of darkness against the church triumphing over and and showing in the heavenly realms that satan was ashamed and he was put to shame and he was actually like you know thrown away he was defeated before us he as if like you know he is like a roaring lion he is coming against but he was defeated by my savior hallelujah 
So we need to remember this. You know, Satan can come with all kinds of plans and schemes and things to disturb us. But we can say, you know who my God is. You have no power over me. Hallelujah. You have no power over me. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 20 to 22, it says that Christ is seated in the heavenly realms, right next on the right hand of God, above all authority, power, rulers. It's the same word that continues in Colossians and Ephesians. The same verse that comes in Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, spiritual forces of evil. Same. These spirits, Fallen angels who control this world by having their... Satan has his army in, in, in the skies and in the cosmos. He has established army and he wants to control this world. But God has now raised Jesus above everything. There is no power, dominion that is above him. And his name is put above everything in this world and in the world to come. Ephesians chapter 2 says that next to him, you and I are seated. If you read the book of Ephesians, whether in chapter 1 when he says that God is seated, Christ is seated on the throne. It is not physical, it is spiritual. We cannot see it with our physical eyes. He says in chapter 2, you are seated with Christ. We are not able to see it. It is a spiritual truth. We can only see with our spiritual eyes. And God opens our eyes to see. Chapter 3, he says the church... Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. We cannot see it with physical eyes. He's continued to say, so live in the spirit. Be filled in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Though you exist in this world, you live in the spirit. Then comes chapter 6 where he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against these rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's where our struggle is. If we need to understand Ephesians, what Paul is trying to talk, Paul knows even as he is writing to explain them, he knows this you will not be able to understand. So I pray right, that you may see that Christ is seated. You, we all need a revelation from God to know who my God is, where he is seated, what is his power. Paul says, I want to know him more. I want to know his power of his resurrection. It is not a concept. It is a revelation that has to come. Our minds cannot comprehend. He says God's power is incomparably great. How will I compare God's power with anything? To give even a comparison, there is nothing that is equal. It is incomparably great power that God poured upon Jesus and raised him from the dead. It's the same power that he is putting on the church. Now tell church, when Satan comes against you, do we have to be scared? Hallelujah. You have no power. You have no power over us. Let's read Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. But I want you to read the place where it says, therefore, let's all say it together. Therefore, Jesus said, therefore, go. Tell the person seated next to you. Therefore, go. Therefore, go. Tell them, they will not going to go. Some kind of spirits will not go without praying and telling again and again. Tell them, therefore, go. Jesus said, therefore. So whenever you see therefore in scripture, you know what does it mean? It means that you need to read not down. You need to read what is up before even reading what is following. Jesus is saying, the same Jesus said to the disciples, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go only to the lost sheep of Israel. It's the same Jesus comes now after resurrection. He says, now all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore, now go and make disciples of Israel. All nations. He wants us to go. We need to understand that now Christ has all authority. Satan's power is like, you know, put to shame. And he is now saying, therefore, I have all authority. With that authority, I am sending you. Go into all the world. Are you following me this morning? 
So he's asking you to go into your offices. He's asking you to go into your apartment complexes. He's asking you to speak to people. This year and next year, we want to really concentrate about how every one of us, we will be a witness for Jesus Christ. And we need to start speaking the gospel. We need to proclaim freedom. We need to proclaim the good news. We need to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And your friend comes to you and says that, you know what is happening in my life? My life is the most cursed life. In my life, all of these things happen. In my family, all of these things happen. Even in such difficult and like, you know, unimaginable and, and uh, uh, situations, you can actually tell to them, this is the year of the Lord's favor. How many of you believe that? This is the year of the Lord's favor. And when you proclaim, God will deliver them. God will come because He has chosen. He has chosen to do that. Hallelujah. Finally, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, 2, 3. Are you all with me this morning? With this, we are going to pray. Now think about the illustration that we did and read this passage. Can we all read together? If you see anybody sleeping, this is the right passage to tell them. Anybody who is sleeping next to you, just nudge them and say, Arise! Don't sleep. Let's read together. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people, but the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Darkness and thick darkness over the earth. The entire world is under the control of the evil one. But what God is saying, I have put my spirit on you. So arise and shine. My light will actually shine on you. Because of your shine and dawn, nations will see and come to you. Never be surprised if you have another nationality person as your friend. It was not a coincidence. It was not an accident. God purposefully has brought people into your life. So arise and shine. And that's what the church is called for. To arise and shine that God's glory. They would be able to see that God lives. Have you seen the beauty of the uh, scripture is this. God's people never go and tell that no God is with me. Always it is people who do not know God. They look at them and say God was with them they would see God in our lives. Amen.